think that's just about everybody. Yep, looks like it. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, this has been, uh, it's been a real treat to host all these different events for the BDN over the, the past. It's been a, one of the bright spots of the past year has been getting to really connect with people in a way we've never been able to connect before. Um, one of the unintended side effects has been uh, having these really great virtual events with be able to talk to all these great people. So, um, so thank you again, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Emily Burnham. I'm a reporter for the Bangor Daily News. I write about arts, entertainment, food, all the fun stuff. Um, we're really excited to be working with Left Bank Books in Belfast on this event tonight to celebrate the release of Maine-based novelist Gregory Brown's debut book, The Lowering Days, which I had a chance to read a couple months ago, and it is great, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, joining Gregory is Pulitzer Prize winning main author Richard Russo, who will be asking questions and posing discussion points to Gregory to get a peek inside his craft and theme of his book. Um, for those of you in the audience tonight who are subscribers, thank you for your support and welcome to all of you who may be joining us on our BDN events online meetups for the first time. Uh, if local journalism is important to you, please consider purchasing a subscription to the Bangor Daily News. Uh, we'd also like to thank our Tourmaline sponsor for this event, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, who have been an amazing partner over the past well, quite a long time um, helping us put on these great events. Um, as a reminder, this event is being recorded, so be aware of that. Um, and we will be taking questions from the audience towards the end of the discussion. So um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Gregory or Richard, uh, please uh, put those in the chat function. You'll see at the bottom where it says chat. Uh, please just put your questions in there. I'll gather them all and then we'll ask them uh, at the end of the talk tonight. Um, so I guess I think that's everything. So I'm going to hand this over to Barb from Left Bank Books, our gracious co-hosts, and uh, to give another further introduction, talk a little bit about the shop, and talk about Gregory and Richard. So thank you both, and uh, enjoy. Have fun. Barb. Good evening, and welcome, everyone, to Left Bank Books as we host this discussion between first-time novelist Greg Brown and seasoned author Richard Russo. My name is Barbara Klausmeyer, and I'm one of the owners here at the bookshop. We all want to thank, give a special thanks to Emily for getting us started tonight and to the Bangor Daily News for setting up the platform for this event. Um, it's a real personal privilege for me to introduce Greg Brown to you because I have known him basically since before he was born. His parents were in our Lamas birthing class here in Belfast 39 years ago. So I knew Greg from his very beginning and he was a classmate of my son Peter through the years. However, our paths didn't really cross until he contacted me last spring with word of his first novel. And I'm gonna to confess to you that in the spirit of a prophet never being honored in his home country, I wondered how good a book written by a Belfast kid could be really. But initial reviews spoke of the next Louise Erdrich, so I was intrigued when the uncorrected proof arrived. Now these little paperback galleys are usually quite drab and unassuming, but this one had the final cover uh, art on it with simulated hardcover flaps and deckled edges on the pages, so I knew that HarperCollins believed in this book. So dipping into it, I was really blown away from the very beginning. Oh. I felt I was under the spell of a young and masterful storyteller. His style is immediate and lyrical, full of fresh imagery and uniquely main characters. Set in the 1980s along the Penobscot River Valley, so close to our home here, he writes of a former mill town. Its shuttered mill is about to reopen when suddenly it is burned down by a young arsonist who plants seeds in advance to hasten the return of nature to the mill site. We learn that the mill has been built on land owned originally by the Penobscot native people who have both earned their living there and suffered the terrible effects of processing pollutants in the river. Greg sensitively portrays the stresses between the native and the local white population and hints at fault lines of tension within family relationships while inserting intriguing native mythology and lush nature scenes from forest to seacoast. As Richard Russo puts it, there's magic here. 
and both our publicist Nancy and I were thoroughly stunned by its spell. I also happen to be a huge dog lover, as in a lover of huge dogs, and Greg describes harrowing situations with dogs in two different places, which just cemented my delight in the book. I actually want to share with you a passage about a stray wolfhound who happens upon a moonlit skating party, if you'll indulge me. We were at a January bonfire beside a small ridgetop kettle pond not far from our house. Parties like this with their particular magic happened regularly under the full winter moons. Massive pyres of wood were built on the shores of frozen lakes and touched off in 20 foot tall blazes. Guitars and mandolins and banjos and singers came out. Chainsaws were set down and flannel coats shucked off. While the players sawed their joyous noise through the night, people danced and spun, reveled and dipped and slid and embraced. Kids and adults threw snowballs and others spilled onto the ice to slide and skate. Maple syrup was poured over snow and whiskey and beer passed from hand to hand. It seemed as if the dog had come out of the woods simply sh and simply shown up at the bonfire, but frightened by the intensity of the blaze, it lurked around the edges of the pond where the vegetation was thickest and the ice thinnest watching us. The ice had been measured at 12 inches all across the pond. It should have held. Someone tossed a snowball out into, into the sky and that massive dog shed all its hesitation and launched into pursuit across the ice. The dog was there and then with a sharp crack, it was gone. My father let go of my mother with whom he'd been dancing and strode across the ice while his entire community yelled at him to stop. My father didn't seem scared at all. He centered his weight and walked out into the night, convinced that whatever fragility might haunt the glassy surface would not harm him. It was brave and it was noble, but beyond anything else, it was a foolish thing to do alone and without any safety equipment. He knelt at the icy lip of the hole, rolled back his coat sleeve and plunged his arm into the frigid water, holding a flashlight. The dog had been running when it broke through, which meant its momentum might have carried it under the ice past the point where it entered. My father was hoping the small spot of light might give the animal something to locate. Eyes blasted with fear. The wolfhound came up through the opening after a few moments and Arnaud somehow pulled the great beast free. When we hiked home, the dog followed us. My father yelled at him and my mother told him to scram. When my father threw a stone at the dog, it paused for a moment and sat down in the snow. My father hung his head, ashamed of his cruelty, and told us to go on ahead. In the morning, I woke to the sharp crack of the spitting all, splitting all. My father was out in the yawn, yard in the dawn light, splitting ash logs. There at the edge of the gravel was the wolfhound, watching, divorced from whatever prior ownership that it had known, forever loyal now to us. So that's just a sample of the vivid narrative skills of our author tonight. Greg is joined by a longtime friend of Left Bank Books, Pulitzer Prize winning Richard Russo. It's my thorough delight to welcome them both in conversation about a very special new novel, The Lowering Days. Welcome, Greg and Rick. Thank you, Barb. It's so great Hello. to be here. Hey, Rick. Great to see you, Greg. So yeah. we'll be after, um... It's strange, isn't it, when you when you when you read somebody's work before you meet them in the flesh, you feel like you already know them. Yeah, it, it is, and I mean, I I have been reading your work for for twenty years and and loving it, and I feel like I know you through your books, even though we we've, we've just met. So I think we're having the same experience in some yeah. ways, just over different timelines. Well, um, as as lovely as it was to hear your voice um, through Barbara, I think we should begin by hearing your own voice. Um, would you like to read a a, a short I um, a short passage for us, and then we'll then we'll chat. I would love to. Um, and 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 thank you, Barbara, for for bringing that passage to life. And thanks to to Left Bank and to the Bangor Daily News for for putting this together. It's incredibly sweet and kind of like peak nostalgia for me uh, in many ways. But it, it's always nice to hear. I think it's always nice. I don't know how you feel, Rick, but to hear your words or what you've written out loud from another person. Because that, that doesn't always happen. You get so used to just like being in your office, reading your own work out loud to yourself. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just read briefly from the beginning of the book. 
just to kind of invite everybody to enter the world of the novel. Um, the book starts with a very short italicized passage that I have always thought of as kind of an incantation into the world of the book. I'll begin there and then I'll move into the first chapter and read a, a page or two. What's the story of this place, this valley, this river, this bay? The story of this place? The story of this place is simple. The men take the women away and the sea takes the men away. But how do the men take the women away? Love, fists, knives, pregnancies, money, guns, words, love. How does the sea take the men away? Very, very easily. Just a little swoop of wind, the leap of a single mischievous wave. It's like taking a breath. That's all freedom ever is, the ability to breathe. Try it, open your lips, press your tongue down against your back teeth and close your eyes. Yes, sugar, just like that. Now take a breath, make it small. Think of a newborn's lungs, no bigger than a clementine. Now take that breath. You feel it? Of course you do. There's another man gone by the sea. And what does the land do through all this? It cries out for justice. One, we were wild kids, always covered in river dirt and sweat. In every corner of the house, one could see our passing. Ochre footprints slapped across kitchen floorboards, sand spilling from our beds, mud from our hands smeared along cabinets and door handles and the hulls of the miraculous boats our father built. With the windows thrown open in summer to the river and the calling of owls and coyotes and wood frogs, it sometimes felt like the line between the world inside and outside vanished. Perhaps that's why my brothers and I never questioned our parents' ability to summon each other back from short and great distances. It wasn't until I was grown that I realized this was unusual at all. Certain cultures believe a song or chant voiced in one place can be heard in another place many miles away. Passamaquoddy people talk of Motowolan, ones with extraordinary spiritual powers who can hear for great distances. All these years later, I am still convinced my parents carried some similar summoning magic. And while I don't have the language for such a thing, I know only this, love should always be able to call love back. That seems simple enough to us as children. My name is David Almer in Ames. The other day I woke with a sudden need to make sense of old things before more new things came on. I guess this isn't so unusual. By giving myself permission to freely survey the lives I grew up among, moving from one household into another, much like the river that surrounded us, I'm hoping to stand in the flow of history without being crushed by its weight. I'm a doctor now, and while one might think I'd seen enough absurdity to throw my hands up to time and chance, the secret curse of being a caregiver is the hunger for control. Every malady has a potential cure if you get to it soon enough. So it is that I've often thought about what could have been stopped had someone gotten between my father and Lyman Creel when I was a teenager. But I'm talking now of mystical things, of surreal places and impossible tasks. To begin the right way, we must start with the Penobscot. The Penobscot River rises from the mountains and lakes of northern Maine and runs down the state like a spine. It shares its name with the Penobscot people, who are the current and original inhabitants of the river and ancestors of the waters. The Penobscot Nation, along with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy tribes were known collectively as the Wabanaki the people of the Dawnland. For thousands of years, they'd been the first people here. Until as prophesied in the visions of elders, ships filled with white faces came from the east, sowing impossible sadness. It was in the east as well that healing was supposed to start. The Penobscots ran their nation from a mile long island rooted in the river and their ancestral territory included the entire watershed. The river, its water, its banks, its islands and Penobscot Bay which over time had become my family's home as well. I'll stop there. Well, it's a great place to start. It was where I was going to start anyway, which is the first line of your um, yes, well. line of your of your um, uh, prologue. Here is what is the story of this place? This is a genuine novel of place. I think, unlike um, my novel of Maine. Empire Falls, which 
is I, I bring it up here only for contra only for the purposes of contrast because mm. I think it is I think it is not and essentially there's a there's a lot of place in it but it's not a novel of place in the sense that I think it's really about class and and actually the same things that fascinated me in writing that novel had all been present in my earlier novels although those had taken place in upstate New York right and and so that's what that's what was that's what was uh, was still fascinating when I wrote Empire Falls. I was terrified of the reception it was going to get because I hadn't been living in Maine that long and I knew how sensitive Mainers are about their place. So I was, I was surprised and thankful not to be ridiculed, but it really isn't a book about Maine uh, or a particular place in Maine quite the way the lowering days is. Yours is the real deal when we're talking about when we're talking about place. Mm. And so let's, let's begin there by uh, letting you talk a little bit um, about how important this place was to you, whether this story, could this story have been told anywhere else? And what, 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 what did you seize on? It's a great, it's a great place to start. Um, you know, what I, I guess what I seized on for, I actually think it's really interesting how place and class often interact and how, you know, sometimes a novel of place is also a novel of class and they can kind of trade spaces at times. Yes. I think like some of the best American fiction or the best fiction, in the, you know, in the world does that. But that's a, you know, a whole other discussion. Um, what, what kind of seized me from a very young age when I first was, you know, starting to think about writing and, and being a writer, I was a storyteller at a young age and I was a writer at a young age because that was kind of my way of telling stories. I was really shy. Um, I had a very hard time like verbalizing what I wanted to bring forth as far as story goes. And I was from a, a family with a lot of really great storytellers for my dad who's here tonight and my, my grandmothers were both fantastic storytellers and my aunts and everybody could spin a tale. But what struck me about growing up where I grew up, um, you know, in, in Belfast was like the aliveness of the world. And I think that's not necessarily unique to Maine. I think that's pretty standard for, for most children who have the space in their childhood to really pay attention and interact with the natural world. Like, you know, from right from the start, like the aliveness of it is present. So what kind of inspired me to, to, to write about place as much as I write about place, and it, it's not just in this book, much of my short fiction is very invested in place. Um, a lot of that is Maine, but there are other stories that I have set in other places that I've lived in places I haven't lived in landscape and place and the particular like tone or atmosphere of an area is always really present. Um, and I think like when I was younger, I always loved the stories that kind of would capture the world beneath the world, you know, whether it was folklore or fairy tales or myths. And I, I think that, you know, there's something very true in that. There's like our empirical world and the world we can witness. And then there's all this other stuff um, running underneath. Mm -hmm. So I think that's often very bound to place or to the land as much as it's bound to culture or religious background, simply because those cultures that create these myths have been so tied to a particular place for a long time, whether we're talking about like Celtic folklore or French folklore or Penobscot lore, all of which come into the book in ways. So just wanting to capture um, the depth of the way land or area can hold, you know, stories and also like the story of human lives in addition to myths that may be told by humans and may be passed down by humans, but maybe emerging from, from something kind of under the soil, if that makes sense. Um, I, I would like in grad school, people would joke and be like, oh, you're, you're all about place again. Oh God, can, 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 can you not like, and I'm like, no, I can't. Like place is always the starting point for me in fiction. Well, one of the things that I found difficult when I was back when I was when I was teaching um, was that that students, especially when you when you started to describe um, the mm. real world, um, and you have some of the most lush descriptions of nature in this book. Um, some of you know some students were it was difficult to convince them that that was the natural starting place for stories. That if you wanted to get into the world of myth and the world of legend and what leads. What, what lives underneath the surface, the only way to get there is through the surface. It is. And they don't, they don't seem to, they can't seem to quite wrap, they, they'll say things like, oh, I'll go back and fill in the, you know, the, the sensory stuff later, what I saw, what I smelled, what I tasted, all this, I'll, 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 we can always go back to that later. 
And my response to that always was, no, you can't. You're missing cues all along the road if you're not seeing the value of the world as it, as it, as it, as it teaches us about itself through the senses. And you seem to, you, you're, you, you're unapologetic about the way that you go about your business that way. No, thank you. I, I am. I just, I think that that's the logical starting point um, in, in so many ways. And it's interesting. I, I had a similar experience or have had and will and still have in, at times, you know, in teaching, um, you know, where place or descriptive writing in general is is being avoided at times, um, you know, in, 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 you know, in favor of dramatizing scene or, you know, having expositional writing or expository writing that's talking more about characters and their backstory. And I, I think it's, great that like you would continually press students to to write about place because it's super important to do and one thing that can happen with teaching is you know you you find your strength as a writer or your student strengths and you kind of keep pushing them towards that and then other parts of the skill set don't get as developed um yeah. and that's that's like oh it's like oh there's all this potential here but yeah you're avoiding descriptive writing or you're you know you're avoiding dialogues it's not your thing but you just you need to develop that skill it's like anything um, it doesn't just naturally happen. Right. That's how we, that's how we, that's what we do with lazy eye, right? You cover up the good eye. Exactly. Force, force, force that other eye, force that other eye to work. Well, along the same lines, one more question about place before we move on. And that is that, that when I was learning the craft, when I first discovered I wanted to be a writer, um, I, uh, I went through a long period where after I'd learned all the nuts and bolts and, and, and I'd learned most of my skills, I was, still, I was still trying to be a very different kind of writer entirely. I wanted to be, I don't know, Ross McDonald or, yeah. or one of the tough guy detective novels. Not, I, I, wanted to write about, I, read, I wanted to write about dames and crime and, and, and <laughs> stuff that I obviously knew nothing, knew nothing about. But um, so for a long time, I didn't, I didn't know where home was did you ever go through a period when you were in when you were younger and you were first trying to be a writer did you go through a period like i did where i thought home would not be sufficient to what i want to this to the sort of writer that i envisioned myself being i absolutely did i i avoided writing about home or or centering myself in this this place um, for a long long time as a writer and i i i had you know i spent the first novel I ever tried to write, and this was back in like 2005. I mean, it was a really bad knockoff of like Cormac McCarthy and it was set in Wyoming and I was just miming that style, um, you know, and it, and then, you know, I went through a period of like kind of, you know, miming Alice Munro's style for a while. And I think like, you know, there's something to be said for imitation at times because you can learn a lot. You just have to be able to be like, oh, wow, okay. So now I need to find my own voice. But I was trying to be, and, and you know, Ellis Monroe in some ways is, is similar in, in a kindred spirit in a lot of ways, I think, to what I, I try to do in fiction. But I was trying to like write other areas and write in other vo voices and other modes because I didn't, I didn't, you know, want to be who I was yet as a writer. And I was still trying to figure it out. And the, there's, there's so much insecurity when, when you start off, um, you know, down this path of fiction writing, particularly if you're a person who's coming into fiction writing as a reader primarily, which, which I was. Um, yeah. You know, I, I didn't have like writers in my life. Um, I had said some artists in my life, but I didn't, I didn't know how to write fiction. I didn't have like somebody I could turn to in my community that I could kind of use as a mentor at a young age. So when you're trying to find your way into being a writer through reading, which I actually think is a really effective way to learn to be a writer, um, you, you are always doubting um, your ability to do this thing that you are falling in love with and are so blown away by. It's like, how can I ever get to this level? So yeah, I, I spent a long time writing about places other than Maine. And my first published short stories, um, you know, back in like 2009, 10, before I went to grad school, they were about other areas. And it, it wasn't until I was in grad school that I started writing about Maine and kind of adopting that as like the place that I did want to bring to life through fiction. And I, interestingly I, enough, I, I, um, I didn't, the novel didn't really take off until I moved back home. And I don't think, I don't think that that's, um, you know, accidental. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move along to talk a little bit about some of the, um, some of the book's themes. Um, it's such a rich and complex novel that we won't get to talk about all of them. Um, but I think, 
um, land, um, in addition to, to being um, in, in the sense of place, it's also important to talk about here in terms of its, of its themes too, because um, the land, um, the land, one of the things the land does, of course, in real life, but also in this book, is that it provides wealth. Right. And it is, um, you know, the Europeans who came to this country had an idea about the land that the people who were already living here didn't. Um, and one of the strange, one of the, one of their strange beliefs was that land was something you could own. And once you owned it, you could do whatever you want with it. Absolutely. You could take whatever you want from it. And as long as you were on that land and you could show the deed of ownership, um, you were pretty much, you were pretty much scot-free. And nobody ever questions that very much. I mean, those of us of that European lineage, we don't question that every day. And yet it is an odd thing, isn't it? This idea that, that, that you're going to stake it out, you're going to build a fence around it, you're going to call it yours, you're going to show the deed, and, and everybody's supposed to stay the hell out of your way. Yeah, it's, it's super problematic, right? <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> And it, it narrows, it narrows, I think it narrows the frame of mind of so many people, you know, in that this is mine, it's not yours. So that's like binary thinking, right? There's no possibility for, for shared space there. Um, yeah, it's, and it, it, it also like, in addition to just owning land or deeding land, there was the, the, the history of, you know, taking land from, from indigenous people. And then, you know, when land was, you know, Open back up, or it was it was you know available you know to 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 tribal nations, you know there was a pressure from from you know European Americans to force indigenous people to adopt farming practices to interact with land in different ways, and like those are further acts of colonization, you know taking taking an area and cutting all the trees down and tilling the soil up and putting it into into agriculture like. You know, that's a very European American kind of conceit for land. So yeah, it's um it's it's very, very short-sighted in many ways, but it's so ingrained to like the American mentality, right? And we yeah. see it everywhere, you know, buy a house, you know, become a first-time home homeowner. Like the American dream is to find a little piece of space, make it your own, and just kind of know that that's yours and hold it very, very tightly. Um so in in the book, I, I wanted to unpack different ways of interacting with land. And I wanted the land very much to be alive, to be a sentient thing, which I think it is. Um, and if more people, I wouldn't say if more people are open to it, but if we can continue to be open to that idea, which I think many of us are, and I think more and more people are all the time, like once you recognize something for like a, you know, the living being that it is, it becomes a lot harder to try to dominate it, to try to control it, to try to force it into like these hierarchical modes. Um, so, yeah, um, land was at the forefront of, of this, as it often has been in my life. I'm always amazed when I'm out walking somewhere in the middle of nowhere, like out in the deep woods, which like is part of the, sh the way I live in the world and my practice as a writer too. And I come across a no trespassing sign. I'm like, you know, there's, there's nothing but 400 acres of forest around and there's a marsh over here. And then there's a random no trespassing sign. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see this all play out too among the various families mm. in 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 the story because they, um, I mean, and and one of them, Lyman, is a is a fisherman who, in in some ways, tries to treat the water the way other people treat the land. He, you know, is, he's a lobsterman and he's he's pretty territorial over his uh, over what he considers to be his water. Um, but but it's it's interesting to watch the, the Ames children, for instance, uh, um, David um, Almeron, the, the the narrator. Um, he grows up these these ideas of ownership have become so ingrained. By the time that David comes along, his entire childhood is is taken up with the idea that this little this little spit of land really does belong to his family, and it's partly a story of his journey to his journey and the journey of other people. Um, in the book to recognize that that's not quite the whole truth here. No, it's not. It's, yeah. it's, it's great to see that realization dawn on, on younger characters in this book too. Yeah, I mean, land, like we, we don't own land, land owns us if anything. And that's, that's part of the awareness that, that David gains 
through his growing up and through all of the, the tragedies that kind of befall the families in the book. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for acknowledging that and, and noticing it. I mean, it's... it's well, and, and, and nor is he the only his arc, you know? important young person here. We have to talk about Molly too, which in terms of the second um, theme that I want to talk about, the other, the other word that was in the... The other word um, that you have from your prologue here is is that's that's emphasized in that prologue is is um, uh, it has to do with the land is that, that this land this place this place we live it all the time cries out for justice right and Molly um, Molly is at the center um, of that it's something she seems to recognize that not everyone does can you talk a little bit about about Molly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Molly was just a pleasure to write as a character in, in, in many ways. What was interesting to me about Molly, Molly was with me very early in the process is, you know, she is in a lot of ways, you know, a, an angsty, misguided teenager, but she also has a very, very strong sense of what needs to change and specifically around how land is being used for, for the place, this area of the valley to get better. Um, so Molly is the one who we've talked about a little bit, you know, she, she starts the fire that burdens the mill down and her father, Adam, his, was a mill worker. He's been out of work for, you know, 18 months now. And she's watched him struggle with the financial difficulties of that. So she, she wants to stop the mill from doing further harm to the land. She wants to take agency and try to prevent that and kind of uphold the land and protect it. But she also is terrified that her dad's simply going to slide back into working at the mill. Um, cause that's, that's the only thing he's been able to do consistently to support the family. So it's a personal crisis in addition to an environmental and like a cultural crisis for Molly. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting actually to, um, to play an audio clip for everybody out there. Um, it's a way of kind of shaking up the, the various forms we're bringing. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play about a minute and a half long clip. And it is of the, the letter that Molly sends to the Loring days that Barb mentioned in the introduction where she, you know, claims the act of, of, of the arson. And you're going to hear two voices here. The first is David, David Aaron Barker, who is one of the narrators for the book. And the second is Nicole Altivator, who is a second narrator in the book. Um, she is voicing Molly's part. And Nicole is a Penobscot speaker and a member of the Penobscot Nation. So we get the side benefit of hearing Penobscot through, through her voice, which is a lovely, lovely language. And, you know, the original language of, of the Penobscot River Valley of, of Belfast, frankly. So I'm going to mute my camera and play this, and then I'll unmute. Fire. A letter arrived in the mail at the lowering days. It was written on a brown paper bag instead of dioxin bleached white paper. Dear readers, this paper is run by a white lady but she's a white lady who cares. Her heart is in the right place. She gives us the space to be seen and heard. Will you, Winnie? This paper has also shown it cares about truth for everyone, whether human, white, Penobscot, mountain, tree, river, or air. So this paper gets the truth. Ganudaman, Wazel Mo Nazibo, Wazel Moltbawag, あっ、のどのばんのばのわつけるよ。けっ、あばじいれ、あがらべも。わがるけ。うにいわ、べのわつけるよ。あだ、あばじいらくえ。ねじ、なうんちんとうてなな。あだ、あばじいらくえ。
I'm wondering because it's it's very hard to talk about um, issues of justice um, as they play out um, in in this book um, without also talking about reparation. Right. Although that's a question, that's a that's a subject that not an awful lot of people want to talk about. It seems to me, and it doesn't seem to whether we're, whether we're talking about um, um, people who have who have been thrown off land that was was theirs, uh, or whether we're talking about um, the fact that that um, cotton never would have been a productive, um, 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 cotton, cotton never was self-sustaining without, um, cotton growing was never self-sustaining without um, basically free labor, which brings us free labor, which brings us back to slavery and what in this, these centuries um, long since, what sorts of reparations um, are, um, are, are due as a result of those injustices. Um, what does the Lowering Days have to say, do you think, about the issue of, of reparation, whether it's even possible? Yeah, not only is it possible, but I think it's necessary. And I, I think like, you know, there, that has long been known and I, I hope there's a greater awakening coming to that point as, as we move forward, you know, as, as a country. Um, as far as what the, what the book has to say, I, I think that one of like the, the barriers to the idea of reparations has always kind of seemed to be this idea that to, to make amends, to, to give reparations to people that have been oppressed and wronged um, somehow is going to then prevent the oppressor from having something. You know, you know the you know the the European American culture that has done this harm is going to lose something by giving something back, and I think that's a really narrow way, right, of, of looking at that, and that's a kind of pattern of fear that is in, in internalized by colonizers. You know, you I think that you know we took this thing, and so by giving something back, the people that receive it back rightly are then going to turn around and, and take from us or harm us or cut us out. And that's like a really narrow and a really fear-based way of thinking about this. So the lowering days kind of asks in many ways, like how people who have been living in small towns or rural areas or anywhere in the country or world in these cycles of kind of resentment, of oppression, of violence, of taking from others in order to have and thinking that there isn't going to be enough for them, which we see in Maine, um, not just in like interaction between non-indigenous and indigenous culture, we, we see it through through the bigotry and the oppression of like of, of French community in Maine. Um, you know, we, we see it again and again, how one cultural group thinks there won't be enough if they see it anything. So how do you trade those patterns for kind of this idea of a life of not forgiveness, which I think is, is an overused concept in some ways, but compassion for being able to, to see the wrong that's been done, being able to have it recognized and being able to approach it in a restorative way. Um, and that's that's something that's at the heart of, of all me, the narrator's kind of struggle here. Um, in addition to the historical elements that, that he has witnessed and he has seen passed down time and time again, there's also personal elements of, of wrong and tragedy and violence that are perpetuated against his family, some of which his family actually carries out. And he's faced with this choice later in the book of, you know, how do I be better in how I, you know, interact or what I bring to people. And that was always kind of too at the, at the heart of, of Molly's character, because her act isn't one of just destruction, and, and Barb mentioned this too, you know, the, the, the hope isn't just to level the mill, there's no point in that, like arson for the sake of arson doesn't do much, um, she wants something new to emerge in that space, and she, before the mill burns, she goes through and she, she plants seeds, um, and after, in the, the history in our country of, of industrial sites, like being burnt or being harmed, or whether it's an environment, an act of environmental justice or eco-terrorism, there's debate about terms used there. Usually it returns to industry, right? It becomes a mill again, or it becomes some type of land-based industrial site. Um, and that doesn't happen in this book. Um, Molly's kind of vision comes to fruition, and then I, I won't give away too much, but the, the land is, is made into to something very different. The land is recognized as living and recognized as somebody else's and it, it, it's essentially given back to the nation through a, a channel of, of events. I wanted to, if we have time, I wanted to read another passage, passage really quickly. Um, and it pertains to this conversation that we're talking about and it also kind of pertains to the rebirth of the mill. And for, for selfish reasons, I, I just, I like like the, the poetics of plant names too. And that, that comes up in this passage. So this is Molly reflecting on 
the fire after she said it. And her and her dad have been kind of forced to, to go into hiding. Um, Adam knows that if Molly turns herself in, you know, um, the institutional response of predominantly non-Indigenous, you know, corrective system is it's not going to be good in any way, shape, or form. She spent the summer and fall sneaking into the mill, exploring the layout, learning its topography, figuring out what would burn and how, devising a plan. Her goal was not just fire, but rebirth. At night, she peppered her father with questions about plants and gardening, and he gleefully went on and on like a man who'd rediscovered an old friend. Pushing deeper inside the abandoned mill site, she planted fire-loving seeds and seedlings wherever she thought the land would support life. She delighted in the small gorilla act of slipping a living pocket of complex DNA beneath the earth of a hulking paper mill whose days, she was convinced, were numbered. While most of the world watched the news or dozed off, dreading getting up for work tomorrow, here Molly was digging holes for shag bark hickory trees in green spaces between maintenance sheds and loading docks. Even with all her planning most days, the fire seemed impossibly foolish. But when she thought about stopping, she saw that tall, aloof boy and his white face theorizing to her about change. As winter set in, she began picturing the world she was trying to build after the flames. Who knew what seeds would germinate, activated by fire as plants had been for millennia, and what would pass on with the burn? Pitch pine and scrub oak and larch and willow, blazing star and wild lupin and fireweed. If they came, they would come as a tapestry of new life, emerging from the ashes. Hearing you read makes me want to talk with you a little bit about, I mean, we've, we've gone into some pretty heady um, territory right. in this conversation, which pleases me. I hope it pleases other people uh, yeah. as much as I've enjoyed this. But um, hearing, hearing you read and remembering the sensation, what it felt like to read your book, I do want to kind of talk about language a little bit. Oh, please do. Yeah, I, I always love talking about language. It's probably uh, fairly evident. I wonder, I wonder if you are, as I am, um, a compulsive reviser. I, I don't, I would hate to think that sentences like the ones in this book come trippingly off your tongue no. uh, in, in, in first draft form, because that, that would kind of kill me, Greg. <laughs> no, Rick, no, yeah. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> That's what we always want. Like when, when we encounter beautiful sentences, we want to know that the writer like had multiple, multiple passes at it. And we want them to, to own that. And I, I will own that. Yeah, I am. I am like a chronic reviser. And there's that fine line too. I mean, Toni Morrison talked and wrote about this where you get to a point where you're just tinkering. You know, you're just, you're, you're not necessarily revising anymore. You're not making a better, you're just tinkering, you're moving things around. And I struggle to stop before I get to that place. Um, you know, just for like an example, I mean, the, the first short story that I published, um, it went through 29 drafts and that's a 5,000 word short story. <laughs> and, and I spent months and months and months writing this. And, you know, it was rejected 17 or 18 times before it was finally picked up. And every time it was rejected, I just just launched into revising it more. And I, I mean, it hurt that it was rejected, but it was, you know, new to writing and knew I needed a thick skin, but I also loved that I could go back to it and keep working on it because if it wasn't accepted, it wasn't done yet. Even now, you know, when I read aloud from the lowering days or when I think about the book, I'm like, oh, I, I still want to work on yeah. stuff here. <laughs> I mean, are, do you have that same? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. that's so reassuring to hear. It's one of the things that's difficult to go back and read a book of a few years later because you do, it's yours. You should be able to go back and revise it if you want you to. Should, yeah, and if you reach out to your editor and ask that, they just look at you like you're crazy, you know? <laughs> well, and part of it is too, Greg, I think with me, I, 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 I'd like to think it probably happens with you too, is that even after you've done that draft 17 or draft 29 and you think, all right, if I work on this much longer, it's going to get worse instead of better. So better that I, so better that I, that I stop. You, you can especially for your comic writer, your really good jokes begin to fall flat after you, after the 29th time. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I find that no matter how many drafts I've done, when I'm going through sometimes just with the idea, all right, just one more cosmetic little, little tinkering job. And then I'm going to go. And then suddenly right in the middle of that, I think, oh my God, what about this? And something new will open up. 
And you kind of, I kind of look at that and think to myself, ah, oh, crap, because this is now right in the middle of the draft, this, this section that you thought was ready to go. Yeah. Now in first draft again, because there's a whole, there's oh, a whole start section. all over. Oh, it's never there's ending. Yeah. No, it has to be there. But, but now, now you're in some ways you're right back where you were. Cause now this stuff is this, depending on how much there is, a lot of it's going to be rough again and it may open things up in other chapters and stuff like that that you don't want to do you'd like to contain it and it won't and it just won't be it won't no and and it, it doesn't just happen with stories i mean that happened with the loring days i mean my, my agent jonas strauss who's, who's a lovely agent and he's, he's here tonight listening in our conversation when when i sent the book to him i thought it was done and he loved it and he wrote to me and was interested in talking about representing me and i had to tell him that i had noticed something that wasn't right and i had kind of picked it apart and I had totally rewritten the novel <laughs> when I got in there I just had to un I had to unthread the whole thing so I'm like you know that's awesome I'm, I'm totally rewriting the book you love so just give me a couple months or you know and I'll get back to you with with that and like bless his heart he was open to that to to like oh here's this book I've received and I really like it and it's totally being rewritten um yeah I I, I want I want that rewrite um yeah. so it, it's not just a story problem <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and, and you know, they, they, yeah, it's 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 a real thing, and I'm so happy to hear that. You know, it's it's not just me. Yeah, no, far no. Emily, I see you. Um, you're 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 yeah. on the screen again. I take that to mean that it might be time to go to questions. I think it is time to go to questions, and you know, actually, uh, uh, first, um, I have a question. Cool. Um, so I'll kick it off. Um, and one thing I'm always curious about whenever I, I read anything um, is the process by which a writer creates characters. Um, because you have this very dynamic family and di lots of dynamic characters at the center of this, in, in this story. And as someone who grew up down the street from you when we're pretty much the same age, um, I, I, of course, think that I, I see people I know from Maine in your book. So what I want to know is, what is your process of, of, of creating characters, of characterization, of how you create these people? Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Like how you, you know, like, is there, is, does someone come first? Does the family come first? Can you just talk a little bit about that process for oh, you? I'd be, be happy. I mean, where characters and where they, they come from, like, there's many things in writing that are kind of like a spooky arc. And I, I think like the emergence of character is one of the one of the most spookiest things. Um, there are there are times when I have an idea of a character that I might need. Like I, I need this particular type of character for this scene to do this particular thing. And those are kind of functional characters that serve a narrative purpose. But the, the good characters, the real ones, like they they just kind of emerge oftentimes and they start like kind of haunting you or niggling at like the, the the edges of your imagination. So what what I find is I will often have a flash of an idea for a character. And it, it's usually something like a gesture, a very small thing, you know, a, a way of, a way that like somebody kind of turns their head when they're receiving bad news, for instance, like a particular way, like something lands with one. And then I, I just, I go really slowly and I try to kind of take in the world through that character's eyes as much as I can. Um, and I know that that sounds a little, I don't think mystical is the right word, but it, it, it isn't very concrete. But you know, just going through your daily life, trying to inhabit the consciousness of a fictional creation, like that's that's part of the way you figure out who these people are. And then you know, once you have an idea of the character and the character feels really alive to you, there's this amazing thing that'll happen when a character's doing something. And like, oh, I did not see that coming. I didn't I didn't think that that Ami or or Lyman would do this thing. I like you know, and of course, you know, it's, it's coming from, you know, your creative, your creative space, your imagination, but it feels very channeled in ways too. And then, you know, as far as fleshing out characters, there's, there's all the kind of craft type elements or the, the writer's toolbox you can get into, you know, how you can define character through dialogue, through action or reaction, how you can characterize somebody versus, you know, through the, the characterization of another person, how somebody presents somebody you know, how Fallon presents Lyman tells us who Lyman is. And then if Lyman goes and acts in a way that's completely opposed to how Fallon's characterized him, that makes him, you know, more interesting or more complex right away. So I think it's a, it's a process of going really, really slowly and trying to see the world through your character's eyes until you have a pretty good idea of who they are and then kind of applying some narrative technique, if, if that makes sense. Absolutely, of course. 
Um, we've got a, a couple other uh, great questions that are here in the chat. Um, uh, the first one is from Joe Haskins, who asked uh, pretty early on about your writing process and um, sort of how you go, you know, do you have a, a daily set time? Do you write in the morning? Do you write in the evening? Um, did you write an outline? Um, you know, and a little bit, of, you already talked a little bit about that in just talking about how you create your characters, but um, can you just talk a little bit about your process in terms of your, the day-to-day -day writing process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, for the longest time when I was younger, I used to like write in the middle of the night and stay up to all hours. And I, most of what I wrote, I would think was amazing at the moment. And I would look back and be like, oh, this isn't very good. <laughs> um, so I, be, because of life, I, I adopted a, a process of, of writing in the mornings and I don't write every day. Um, I've never been the type of writer that writes every day. Um, I, I work on writing every day, um, whether that's thinking about the project that I'm working on or kind of like trying to, to build character in my imagination or parse out elements of a scene. And I do a lot of note taking too. Uh, when I am writing, I tend to write in the mornings. Um, you know, that's just like, that's the best time. And it's not always possible, but if I have a day where I can get up and launch straight into writing and write till like 10 o'clock, I mean, that's, that's beautiful for me. Um, Process-wise, one of the things that I've consistently done for the whole time I've written fiction and probably will continue to do is, you know, and it's similar to the character and how I build character in some ways, I go very slowly at first, um, kind of accruing elements of the world, of the story. Um, I spend a lot of time note-taking and journaling and having this kind of conversation via notebooks with myself. And there are always these open-ended questions like, what if, what if instead of being honorably discharged, you know, Arno is, is a deserter? Um, from the Vietnam War and what if instead of being like maligned by his community which unfortunately was what happened to so many deserters in, in America what if Arno is kind of forgiven and embraced and becomes like um, a, a, a community figurehead in ways so these kind of questions are, that are really open and I kind of have a dialogue with them and they, they present avenues for the work that I wasn't you know, even anticipating. So once that kind of comes together and I, I have the book or the scene or the character I'm working on I write very quickly. I try to get like a draft of a scene, a chapter, um, you know, a section down as fast as I can. I often write in longhand and then I go back and totally rewrite it. I don't just revise it. All the tinkering Rick and I talked about that comes later. Um, I just take the first draft and I rewrite it entirely. Um, so I, I go really slow and then I go really, really quick and get it down. And then I spend a long, long, long time revising it process wise. Great. Um, another question uh, from Solomon Goldman. He asks, um, is the name Molly a reminder of Molly Molasses, who of course is, was an incredible Penobscot woman from the uh, 18th and 19th century. Uh, is that the case? It's not, it's not exactly the case. I'm very aware of, of Molly Molasses and you know, there are, have been very, there's many, many Mollies in Penobscot history who have been important cultural um, figures. So, I wasn't drawing or kind of making a nod to any particular Molly, but but I did have you know an awareness of those Mollies. Oddly enough, when it when it came to Molly's character, I had a I had a hard time with her name, and I usually don't. And I asked I asked my daughter actually, who at the time was like four years old. I'm like, I need some names, and she gave me a list of names, and one of the names was Molly, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's the right name for a lot of reasons actually. Um, uh, Carolyn D asks, um, and you talk, maybe have mentioned this a little bit already, but, um, what research did you do to, did you do to prepare for the book? Yeah. Um, that's a great question too, because research is such a part of novel writing and it, I find it fun. Um, it can, it can be overwhelming and it can be like a wormhole that you go down too deeply and it prevents you from writing at times, but it's, it's always informing the writing. So there were like several specific areas that I needed to do a lot of research for the lowering days. Um, one obviously was how mills work, not just like how they function as a mill, but like what is the layout of a mill? What would the act of burning a mill down, which is kind of this like wild imaginative act, how would that even work? Like where would things have to be placed? Where, where would chemicals be? How, how would this look? So I did a lot of research on arson, on, on toxic site fires, on mill fires, industrial fires. Did a lot of research on the, like the line between environmental justice and eco-terrorism when it comes to acts against industry and, and how those are presented. Um, and I did, there's elements in the book, which we haven't got into here about aviation and flight planes are a big part 
the book and I am not a pilot. Um, that would be a terrible idea to have me fly on a plane. So I, I had to learn how that worked. <laughs> and I have, a, you know, I found a friend of a friend who was a pilot and told me everything that he, he could about it. And I'm just downloading this information. And then, you know, with research, you often kind of write it how you think it is. And then you consult with experts to see if you got it right. And that was the case with aviation. There was a time when I was working on that part of the book where I was just reading many, many, many um, reports about you know, aviation accidents and going down kind of that, that research track. The other element that required a lot of research was um, the use of Penobscot language, which I always knew would be crucial to what I wanted to do in the book, but it's not my language. And, you know, I'm non-Indigenous and well aware of the history of non-Indigenous people writing about Indigenous people and, and how problematic that can be. So I wanted to have as much if I was going to go down this this path with the book, I needed to have inclusion of, of indigenous scholars and indigenous speakers and indigenous cultural experts who are willing to, to help me with that and, and bring me into that world in ways. So I worked with um, the three linguists to get the language in the book right, um, two who were indigenous and, and teach on the island, they're language teachers, and one who is a, a linguist at USM. And I won't mention my name just because I don't know if they want to be mentioned, but they're all in the acknowledgements. And just getting to like go into another space for a while with research is, is so fascinating. Um, so the, the process is kind of trying to get it right yourself and then finding the right people to help you get the rest of the details right and learning how to ask. Um, I think that's something that doesn't get talked enough about with writing. Um, you know, like it, it's just, it's, it's hard to just send an email to somebody and be like, hey, I'm working on this thing and I need help with it. And that's a skill set that has taken me a long time to develop. and. I'm a better writer because of it, I think. Yeah, it's interesting because that's something, you know, we do every day in, in, as, as journalists. Right. That's, that's our job is to ask people, how does this work? How does that work? How do you feel about this? And uh, I, I, funnily enough, you know, sometimes you find yourself for whatever, whether you're, whether you're doing research for a novel or you're writing a, an article, um, you might end up Googling how to burn down a mill, arson. I did that. Like, crashes and then Three you're like times. what am i glad that that you know uh you know uh big brother is is um hopefully not watching me right now as i google things that are incredibly incriminating uh, yeah. um, a YouTube video, isn't there? what's that there should be a youtube video yeah right <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so um we only have time for just probably one more question so i'll ask um one that kind of looks a little bit into the future which is um joanne Desjardins or Desjardins, so however you prefer to pronounce it. Um, uh, are you working on another novel currently? What are you working on right now? Can you talk about it? I can't, I'm so glad you asked that question because Joanne is my aunt. Hey, Joanne, <laughs> it's really cool to, to have the final question came from my aunt. It was, it was here, I didn't, I didn't realize she was here and now I know. Um, I, I am working on another novel and I'm working on finishing kind of the last edits on a linked story collection. So, um, yeah, that's there's there's things happening. We'll, we'll... She says hi, by the way. <laughs> I noticed I noticed in the chat room somebody had asked the question about um, the um, what is the what is the significance of the title, Greg? And that's a question you could answer really quickly. Oh, well, yeah. So the title the title was with me right from the start. It's the only time in my life where I've had a title at the very beginning of a of a, of a work, and um, the title is the. Literally, it's the Lowering Days, which is the name of the newspaper that Fallon, the narrator's mother, runs. Um, the paper's called the Lowering Days. So it has this kind of, um, you know, literal ability to hold space in the book. And then figuratively, there's two ways it works. The Lowering Day in, in Fallon's family mythology, that's the day that a body is returned to the earth. That's a funeral day. So it's the, the day of death, the day of return to the earth. And it's also the day that a boat is launched, according to Arno. Um, that's the lowering day, the launch of a boat. So in, in you know, symbolic or figurative ways, it's, it's bringing or you know, talking about death and the return of the earth and then birth of something. So yeah, that's the lowering days. That's the title. And I always like titles that are, are kind of working on multiple wavelengths if, if possible. That's great. Well, I think that is a great uh, stopping point. So um, thank you both so much, Greg and Rick, for taking some time out of your uh, day and your evening to talk with us. This has been a real treat. Um, thank you so much to, to Barb and Left Bank Books in Belfast. 
great American bookstore. Thank you for being a partner on this event. And we look forward to some future events with you. Um, Alyssa, do you want to maybe mention those real quick? Some of the stuff we have coming up. I know we have a couple other interesting uh, BDN events coming up in the next month or two. Yes, I'm actually just going to mention we do. Um, well, first of all, let me just say I, I want to thank uh, Greg and Rick as well. Thank you guys so much. Again, this is a wonderful. You're welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us. This, is, this has been such a treat, really. We really appreciate it. Um, and we actually do have another event with Left Bank Books coming up on May 4th with Robin Clifford Wood and Christina Baker Klein discussing Robin Clifford Wood's uh, newest book, The Field House. So please join us for that. Um, all that information is up on the BDN Events Facebook page. Uh, this event has been recorded, so I will be sending an email to all registrants after after the fact. I have to get, get, give me time to edit it <laughs> together, and I will get an email out to everybody with this information. But also, please don't forget, uh, you can purchase Greg's book at Left Bank Books, as well as Richard's uh, works at Left Bank Books in Belfast. They've been a great supporter and uh, partner for us. Um, did you guys have anything else that you guys wanted to say before we ended the event tonight? Just, Greg? Just thank you. Really, this is, this has been lovely, and I'm I'm looking forward to 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 more events. You know that that, that BDN put on with Left Bank. It's, it's a beautiful bookstore. And, yes, you know. and there will be there are many people here listening in from many places, but support your local independent bookstore. Absolutely, Amazon doesn't need you, so stay right away from them. You know. And your local. Not supposed to say that, but you know we're, we're going to say it. And your local independent newspaper. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely night. Thank you, everyone.